On the show today, we're talking about what the heck is a human factor, and we're also talking Pokemon Go. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Here are your hosts, Nick Rome and Billy Hall. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. My name is Nick Rome, Human Factors Practitioner, and I'm joined here today by my co-host, Mr. Billy Hall. I gotta be honest, I'm glad we're talking and sitting, talking about Pokemon Go right now, because honestly, my legs are exhausted. And I just want to rest for an hour because I've been out there catching all the Pokemon. Gotta hatch those eggs. Yep, yep, yep. So you're listening to Human Factors Podcast. This is our first episode, and we just want to say straight off, thank you for listening so much. And basically what we're going to talk about today is what the heck is a human factor, right? Like, we got to explain what this show is all about. Yeah, I'm wondering about that, too, because to be honest with you, I've heard a lot of things. I mean about different types of psychology and design and things like that that go into these types of games, but I never really see it utilized. So what is uh, what is people going to get out of this sort of podcast? What are they going to get out by listening to us? Yeah, so what you can get out of this show, right? Everyone at heart is a psychologist. Everyone kind of dissects these interactions that they have with humans. Uh-huh. Everyone inter- inter- or sort of dissects these interactions that they have with uh, anything, really. And, uh-huh. and anyone can be a psychologist. And so basically what we're trying to do here is just kind of understand that this is a field, uh-huh. right? Dissecting these interactions. And to leave with a sense of what human factors really is and to be aware of, you know, if you're creating products or services out there, or even if you're just hanging out and using things, just to be aware that all this stuff goes into the design of these things. Okay, so why don't we call it the Psychology of Technology podcast? What is the actual term for human factor? So basically, it's just using science uh, to design these products, systems, or processes to take proper account of how people use them, basically. Uh, it's it's kind of like a marriage of a, of a ton of different fields. It's really interdisciplinary, right? You have psychology, engineering, biomechanics, industrial design, um, and, and anthropometry, basically, to make sure that when we're designing these, these programs, equipment, and processes, that we take the human mind and the body in consideration while we're while we're creating these things. So basically what you're trying to say what I what you're what you're telling me is is that it's kind of like the idea of um like we all know what a save button is. We all know what an exit button is. Red sign, you know, is usually stop and green is usually go. And people are utilizing these in different types of ways, like in apps and games and Things like that? Is that yeah. basically the idea? Well, yeah. I mean, what you're talking about there is actually just a very small subset, right? Those, what you just talked about, are conventions. But there's, it goes way beyond that, right? There's there's a ton of other things that you just... They're well duh. Like, like when you think about them, they're well duh. That should be a thing. But, you know, it, it it's a well duh moment because people have actually researched this and incorporated it into the design of what they create. Okay. So you're a psychologist, but you call yourself a human factors practitioner. I'm, I'm a little confused about that. Right. So, so What is a human factors practitioner? It sounds like a magical wizard. <laughs> so, well, yes, human factors practitioner. I'm actually a human factors engineer uh, by job title, but... Uh-huh. Um, A human factors practitioner is just someone who engages in utilizing human factors um, in in their everyday life, right? And so I I work at a company right now called Pacific Science and Engineering. Uh, We do a lot of contract work for the U.S. military. Uh, And basically what we do there is we develop solutions to problems that improve uh, human performance in complex sort of systems uh, based on scientific principles and methods. Okay, so you basically tackle certain problems or you get projects and you... With the idea, with collecting data and things like that, and you try to solve the problem, so it's kind of universal to whoever's going to be using it. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah, we tailor 
the product or service or or uh, system to the user. So, like, I'm an avid gamer, so you would take a different type of idea of making an, a video game app versus using the latest update of Twitter, which is more general purpose. You would use different data on that, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the users are very different between between those two, right? Mm-hmm. So a gamer is going to have a different demographic than a Twitter user. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, you take in different considerations when developing each system. So how do you tackle those kinds of problems? I mean, like, it seems like such a multifaceted. It seems like you could come at it from so many different angles. Is there a universal way? No. Oh, wow. It depends. It depends is kind of the motto. Uh, you, you kind of are making me believe that you're some, like, black magic practitioner. <laughs> I'm getting a pitchfork ready. So, well, here's the thing, is that everything everything that you deal with, like you just said, video games uh-huh. and Twitter, everything's unique. Everything's different, right? Mm-hmm. Everything has a different challenge to overcome. Everyone has a different user base. And so uh, some methods are good for some things and not so good for other things. It all just depends. It, it all depends. just depends. It depends. I mean, that's, that should be our catchphrase at the end uh, of the show. It depends. It depends. All right, I like it. All right. So you use... I remember doing stuff like this when I was a kid. It was like the scientific method. They gave the age-old adage of, you have a flashlight that doesn't work. First thing you do is you try the obvious choice of taking out the batteries and putting new ones in. If it still doesn't work, you try to replace the bulb. If that doesn't work, then you give your soul to the Dark Lord so you can actually get it correct and then ever have a flashlight that does anything else right yes okay yes giving your soul to the dark lord is a big big <laughs> way big to get a flashlight part of my it. job uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no so you're talking about the scientific method here right so uh yeah we use the scientific method in human factors right mm-hmm. uh we have some sort of question that we want answered so we develop a hypothesis about uh how users interact with this this product system whatever it is and then you you uh you basically prediction test right you have this hypothesis um and then you test that prediction you basically go through and say uh well this is our hypothesis our prediction let's test it and see if that works and if it doesn't then you analyze it right that's when you analyze it really take it apart right Mm -hmm. did was it the light that was the problem or was it the battery uh or in this case, was it the light? And then if it wasn't the light, well, then you form a new hypothesis or a new prediction. Uh, It's the battery then. And then you go through and repeat the process until you find the cause or the solution to uh, whatever it is that you're trying to solve for. Okay. So... So we're going to go over this sort of... we're, we're We're going to go over and take, evaluate certain apps and products and ideas that that we go through. So, how are we going to do that? How are we going to base this on a scale like we can so everybody can actually understand it? Right, so, well, well, this is, this next part of the show basically is the part of the show where we do a review of something that you guys, our listeners, send in. Uh, and this could be anything from, like, a video game to a website, a web application on your phone, Basically, what we'll do is we'll take a look at the usability of the app mm-hmm. when considering uh, the 10 sort of industry standard usability heuristics. Heuristics. Now, we're making an evaluation based on this heuristics thing. Yeah. What is a heuristic? Right. A heuristic is... Uh, I like to think of it as kind of like a mental shortcut uh-huh. uh, that sort of ease the mental processing power of making some sort of decision, right? So think of think of like a rule of thumb, right? Uh-huh. Or an educated guess or common sense, really. Like think about, okay, well, here's a good example. So think about uh, if you were to go up to a lock that had three digits on it to where you basically th- thumb through zero through nine on each digit, right? Mm-hmm. Now, if you knew this was... I don't know, someone's, if you knew someone who this lock belonged to, and you knew their favorite number was like 729 or something like that. That's a weird thing to come up in a conversation, but I follow. Right, right, right. So, I mean, let's let's just say you know their favorite number is 729, or, or their birthday is July 29th, those kind of things, right? So, so 
you would approach this lock and go, okay, I know the kind of numbers that are associated with this person. Uh huh. I'm going to try those first. I'm going to try 729 first. Okay. And if it unlocks, you've just saved yourself a ton of work. Yeah. Whereas if a computer were to attack this situation, it would attack it very serial, right? It would go 001, 002, 003, until it got to 729. So it takes a computer, probably can process it a lot faster, but it goes through more uh, sort of iterations of testing than the heuristic would, right? Okay, okay. So... Who made these heuristics? Right. Uh, so, uh, Jacob Nielsen is widely regarded, regarded as the guy uh, in usability who... He, he's kind of a big name in the human factors or usability field because he's, uh, he's done a lot of research, published a lot of books and articles about usability, um, and his heuristics actually are widely accepted as sort of the industry standard. And, uh, you know, his, his ten heuristics are, are good rules of thumb for interaction design, which can be applied to almost any interface. So this guy's kind of like the grand poobah of the heuristics practitioners. Like, he's the one who made everything that we're going about. Right so to now. speak, so to speak, yeah. So, so Billy, what are we, what are we reviewing today? Well, we're going to be reviewing Pokemon Go. You're excited. I am jazz. I am sore, but I am happy because the little twelve-year-old in me that I have, you know, stuck down deep inside is so excited that he finally gets to ha- go out and fight a real Charmander. Are you secretly a '90s kid? I am a '90s kid. I actually am a '90s kid, which makes me feel so old. All right, so what is Pokemon Global Offensive? Is it actually called Global Offensive? No. <laughs> oh my gosh, that would be so awesome if it was. <laughs> I'm We're going to militarize so... a whole generation of children playing it. Oh my god. Well, it's hugely successful AR game. Right. Uh, what is what is AR? Augmented reality. Right. Funny enough, my phone can't actually handle most of the augmented reality, but it's hugely. Like if I look through my phone and I see a bush in front of me in the real world, I can look through my phone and then there's a cute little pocket monster Pokemon right in front of me that I can catch with red balls or different types of capture things and then like much like uh, Michael Vick I have them fight for my amusement oh man so so those of you who are listening and <laughs> those of you who are listening and don't know what augmented reality is it's basically when you take uh, sort of an overlay of reality and put some virtual component on top of it. So in this case, it's using the phone on your camera to basically capture what's around you in your environment, and it overlays these cute little monsters on the screen that you have to flick a ball at to catch them. Sounds pretty simple. It sounds simple, right? Right. So are you are you enjoying the game, though? I'm having a great time with the game if it worked 100% of the time. It like works That's like the thing, right? Me, I'll I'll be generous and say about sixty five percent of the time. I was gonna give it fifty. It it really seems up in the air for me. Yeah, you know, it's like Russian roulette of your weekend. You'll walk four miles and hope that it records all the steps. My eggs. <laughs> My <laughs> eggs. So let's explain a little bit more for the listeners who aren't familiar with Pokemon Go. So in the game, you basically collect these monsters, right? The the motto of the franchise is gotta catch them all. Right. And so what your objective is in this game is to catch them all. And one of the ways that you do that, when we, when we reference eggs, so one of the mechanics in the game is, is basically you go to these real-world locations called Pokestops. Any place that is have ha- of uh, historical significance, artistic significance, or cultural significance in the neighborhood. Right. Which so, can mean a lot of things. Right. So you go to these places... And you get these little sort of... You get items for visiting, right? Pokeballs. You get Pokeballs, you get potions, you get different ways to enhance your playing experience. And one of the items that you get is an egg. And the only way to hatch these eggs, which contain more Pokemon that you need to catch, is to walk. And uh, right now... Uh, it only tracks it if, if the app is in the foreground and if you are, um, in, you know, walking a significant distance. And you're a little bit lucky, to yeah. be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, server errors are just all over the place, and it's not just 
us. I mean, a lot of times I would log on there and the servers would be down. This yeah. game's almost been out for a week. It has been out for a week. It has, it, yeah, it's been out for a week, and there's still server errors. This thing still go down. My game crashes more times than anything else, and I don't have um, a wussy phone, you know? I, I don't have, like, the high-end stuff, $700 worth, but I've even seen those $700 phones not be able to make the snuff. Well, yeah, it has, it has nothing to do with the hardware. It has everything to do with the software, right? This app is kind of really just in trouble right now. Um, but it's a lot of fun. I don't want to deter from that. Either. No, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And and that's one of the points that we'll make at the end of this episode is, is what we kind of thought of it overall. But, but yeah, I mean, I think it's a fun game. And, uh, you know, so I guess let's just go ahead and tackle these. So we're going to probably break this up into the different... You said there were ten points of heuristics. Yeah, there's ten that heuristics, this nice, right. That this guy broke down. Let's get back to so, the heuristics, yeah. Yeah, uh, so... We're going what's, back to it. Yeah, what's, uh, what's the first heuristic? The first one is visibility of system status. Can you give me a little description on that? Visibility of system, system status. System status. Yeah. So with this one, basically what this is saying is that the user should always be sort of knowledgeable about what's going on. Uh, and, and the app should give them feedback that makes sense within a reasonable time. Okay. Right? Okay. And basically, as a user, I know what's going on. Okay, so, like, I'm in the middle of a field. In I'm in the middle of the field. I open this app. I know exactly what's the process in the game currently. Do you? No. <laughs> yeah. I, I find myself... I mean, like, I know because I've been playing an awful lot, but it's more trial and error than actual visibility. I mean, the tutorial was vague at best. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, yeah, in Pokemon Go, you know, the, you really just have no idea as a user what's going on, right? It has, like, a tips section. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't really elaborate very well. I mean, mm -mm. it tells you, you know, there's a Pokestop and there's a gym that you can go to. I think uh, it gives you a little window that says does. move it, to yeah, go well, to this place, but it's very brief. Yeah, it's it's brief, and it's at the beginning, so if you glance over it, you might not, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, it, like, there's there's things that they do give you, right? So, like, when you go to a Pokestop, mm -hmm. uh, spin, the, spin the thing, spin the image, and you'll get items. It gives you that. When you go to a gym attack them, this is how you attack. You tap on the screen rapidly, or you swipe left and right to dodge. Mm -hmm. well, it gives you that, right? The things, right. The things it doesn't give you, right, is like, like what are flowers on a Pokestop? You, you the see little the, puddles thing. Yeah. yeah. I've explained that to people a bunch of times. Right. That it's a lure that lures Pokemon to that one space, so you don't have to run around right. a whole park to look for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it brings Pokemon to you, but it's not it's, I mean, you see a lure in your inventory. Right. And it explains what the lure is, but it doesn't explain how you even attach it to a Pokestop. Right. I haven't even done that yet. I, I've just been using other people's lures. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like, do you know how to put one on there? I don't. I assume I just tap it and then tap the... No. If you tap, uh, if you bring up the lures out of your backpack, it'll just be grayed out. You, there's actually a process to it. That's see, I didn't even know. Like, and you've been playing this game as much, probably as much as I have. Yeah, but you just haven't used Allure, and I had to have it explained to me too. Trial and error. Right. Yeah. It's these kind of things, right, that don't give that good visibility of system status to the user. Mm -hmm. It just, uh, I mean, like another one. Like I'm just thinking about the tracking feature, right? The, mm -hmm. There's. So, for our listeners who aren't familiar, there's a tracking feature in the lower right-hand corner of the screen that kind of shows you where the Pokemon what, are. What Pokemon are nearby and how close they are. And, uh -huh. and I should mention, too, we have these pictures up on our Instagram and our uh, Facebook. On Not our, to all, mention that there's tons of stuff on YouTube about all Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can find them anywhere. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, they have these these uh, Pokemon trackers, and they don't really tell you how to use them. In fact, you know, no one has really, like, definitively figured out how to use these things yet. Yeah, it seems like they gave you, us, all the tools to do everything, but they didn't tell us how to do it. It's kind of like, um, it would be kind of like if we dropped a bunch of iPads in a country that never seen a computer before. Or, you know, in my case, if you dropped a bunch of 
uh, <laughs> a bunch of wood off and a, and a couple tools and said, you know, build build a couch. Well, I have uh, an idea. Uh, yeah, yeah, I kind of know, but I mean... <laughs> I don't know like, what's going on. You always call me if you need me to ever build a couch for you. Okay? You got it, buddy. You got All it, right. buddy. What's what's our what's our uh, our next heuristic there? I'm sorry. The next heuristic here is match between system and the real world. Right. So, so how, what does that mean exactly? Match between system and the real world. I mean, it's an augmented reality game. Yeah. Well, so what this is talking about is basically that the system. So in this case, the app. Um, the app should speak the user's language, right? With words. Or phrases or it's concepts, all in English. right? It, well, I mean, it is localized, so yeah. So there are different languages in the true, in the true, true, true. Um, but I mean, it should speak the user's language, right? With words or phrases or concepts familiar to the user, uh-huh. uh, rather than like system-oriented terms. And so this is basically like, you know, don't don't speak to the user in errors or code. Um, follow real-world sort of conventions and. And make information appear in a natural and logical order. I mean, you know, basically what this is saying is that, you know, as a user, uh, I know what you're talking about. App. Okay. Um, Well, I mean, for people who have played the old Pokemon games on the DS and the Nintendo games, we kind of have an idea of what's going on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we would have to look at this probably from, like, I'm a person, never played Pokemon, or played Pokemon so long ago, don't remember anything of it. Could they pick up this game and go? Right, like, the the people who are, oh my gosh, this game is getting so much hype, I'm going to download this and try it out, but I've never... I always I've go on walks it. and hikes, might as well do something other than look at Twitter. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, yeah, for these kind of users, though, I mean, what, I, I don't know, I feel like it gives some sort of visual examples right in the beginning. It shows you to flick the ball at the Pokemon. Right. Um, you know, it, it tells you the... to walk to a place, but it's, it's yeah, very brief. Right, 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 right. Uh, I mean, and it's, and it's analogous to the, to the real environment in that sense, right? You can see what's nearby, uh, you know, on your, on your app. You can see what kind of things are nearby. Um, and... You know, it does use English, it's localized, so it uses the language that you speak, hopefully. I don't know how many languages it is localized to, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, but, I, but, I mean, here's here's where it doesn't kind of go with those conventions and standards, right? Like it, it kind of mixes in these these very jargony terms, like Pokestop and Pokeball. Like, you and I know what those are, because we've played Pokemon before. Right, right. right. But but to the people who haven't, like, it's all, it's all a new thing, and... They briefly go over, but they don't go into any detail about them. Yeah. It's they like, say Pokestops are places where you can get items, and Jim is a place where you can put your Pokemon. Right. I mean, yeah, it's it's really, really high level, and, and you know, unless, uh, you know, unless you're an avid player or a historical player, like, you would have no idea what's going on with Like, these. I don't know. I didn't know about, I mean, until, like, two days ago, I didn't know how gyms really worked. Yeah. I mean, but he, well, we're talking about, like, the, the, the language that they're using, right? So, right. Well, yeah, I mean, gym kind of has that connotation of, like... Place to go, work out. Work but, out or train, yeah. So, I mean, I, I get that one, but it's more like the pokey stop. It's, a, it's the pokey... Stop. Pokey stuff. Uh-huh, I get you. Pokey and The jargon of, of it. Yeah, exactly. They... The uh, like, why not call it a capture ball? It doesn't. I mean, it sounds or ridiculous an, as a Pokemon. Or just a shop. Or yeah, a, a stop or something. Yeah. So, so with those kind of things, I feel like it really doesn't do a good job of introducing new players to the mix. But, but veteran uh, Pokemon. Like in the term of design, when players. they're sitting down for that, do they just assume that everybody knows that that Pokemon's just so well known they don't have to worry about that? You know, or that's that's a good question. So I feel like this game went a little viral, right? I feel like mm-hmm. it was meant for the fan base that is Pokemon, and it expanded rapidly because social media and it, it, well, so first off, social media blew up, and mm-hmm. so did the physical world. Like you see this <laughs> influx of all these people staring at their phones and flicking upwards, <laughs> like and talking to each other that hasn't been seen ever. This is this is 
It's huge. It's a weird thing to go out and see people out talking to each other. Like Tuesday night. It's a Tuesday night. I'm in downtown. Uh, I'm in Balboa. Balboa Park and near San Diego in La Jolla uh, in California. And I'm in the middle of there. And usually during the day, the place is hugely crowded. But this is 9.30 at night. Usually, only thing you see there is maybe a few people taking a nice walk. Maybe some people look going through the site. And a bunch of people trying to get some sleep on the street. Right. It's very tranquil. Yeah. I went there, and I'm not even exaggerating that there was five, 600 people there. Walking wow. around, all looking for Pokemon. That's amazing. But will it last? I don't know. I mean, it seems like it, we're having a Beanie Baby situation here. It could be. It For could. all those young kids, Beanie Babies were these um, little toys with rice inside them that everyone yeah. collected and gave up their college tuitions for. Yeah, you it know. It was crazy. Huh. You know, I feel like it could last. It could, but it depends heavily on the development team to really sort of bring it back to the user and really cater to what they need. And if they continue to make it a social experience and uh, you know if they continue to make it a social experience and, and keep adding these features that we need like trading right they, they, they promised us trading it was it was in a videos uh, for it well yeah it was in a trailer for it and uh, that was not at launch right so if they give us these features and they, they add sort of some reason to keep playing right I think it was really smart I I mean I have a inkling that they will expand it past the original 150 Pokemon right uh, and it was very smart to do it in waves yeah yeah I agree because, too because I mean look at look at it this way right so you have you have these waves right so everyone scrambles to get the first 150 right that's a right. lot of them and right. then they'll, they'll probably bring out the next wave, which is only 100. And what if they're smart, what they'll do is they'll lower the chance rate on the original ones. R- gives us plenty of time to get a bunch. And then slowly closes that gap to where they're equal. Oh, I get it. So right? it's kind of like you shut off one faucet to add the other fa- water in, too. So you kind of equal out the... It's like, you know, hot and cold water. Right, 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 right. So, yeah, it's, it's almost like... Almost shutting the original ones off completely, so that way this wave of players can come in and get the new ones, and then you slowly turn them back both to halfway, so that way they flood in at an equal amount. Which makes the original 150 cool, which also gives a little bit of status to people who are playing on day one, which is cool. Yeah, it gives you it gives you incentive to log in when those those big events happen, right? Now the other thing about it is is that. We were talking about that there's a lot of fans. We've been talking about this huge community of viral video. But one of the the other heuristics I see here is about user control and freedom. Right. So the idea of it is is that anybody should be able to understand... From what I've been gathering, anybody should be able to understand what's going on in the app on the screen. Am I right? Well, that's what we were just talking about. But user control and freedom is almost like uh, basically how to... If you make mistakes in the in the app, right? Like, right. Is is there a recovery path? So. Oh, okay. Okay, I get it now. Yeah. So so users often choose like uh, system functions, right? Or by by mistake, right? They accidentally click on that Pokeball. We and, all had that moment where we accidentally hit escape on a document that we were drafting, and we lost the document. Right, that kind of idea. Well, yeah, but thankfully, there's there's things in place that stop you from right. Right, it's like, are you sure you want to exit? Those right. Kind of things. Um, right. Uh, clearly, we're looking for like these clearly marked emergency exits. Right. So uh, when you're on a web page, there's an X on the tab that you're on. Or uh, yeah, in this case, I mean, there's X's all over, and the X itself is a convention. Right. X to escape. If I see an X on a screen, I know that's to get out. Right. And so if you click on the Pokeball to access your menu, you can always hit that X to get out of there. Um, and, and, you know, this is fairly consistent throughout the app. Um, we have pictures of this on our Instagram, too, just to show you the interface if you're not playing currently. Right. And, yeah, you know, the, there are some things where it kind of lacks, though. Like, where's my undo button for a transfer? I'm a new player, um, and I accidentally transfer something, but I didn't mean to transfer my Charmander because that's my first Pokemon. Right. I mean... You know, to be fair, it's a learning experience, right? You can argue that it's training. Don't do you that again. You get a little bit burned. Yeah. Ah, Charmander, I get it. So Charmander's a fire Pokemon. Uh, <laughs> so, 
Right. Uh, I mean, you know, it does it does give you that are you sure message, but I mean, there's no way to recover from it. Basically, we're talking about undos, and it does a pretty good job. Okay, so basically the idea of doing X's and getting out of it and doing that sort of thing, right? Okay, so the next one on the list is consistency and standards. Now, this one kind of perplexed me because it seems very vague. How does consistency and stand what does it mean to be consistent and standards consistency right. and standards i can say it i swear that's okay that's okay just take a deep breath consistency <laughs> and consistency standards. and standards good there we go. <laughs> no. so what this one's talking about <clears throat> this one basically the users uh shouldn't have to wonder whether or not you know different words or situations or actions mean the same thing uh and you, you basically want to follow what everyone else has done this is you know th- this is the seems familiar makes sense right so that x that i was just talking about uh-huh that's a standard you right. see x's in all the apps all the time red light that's the stop. standard right yeah exactly um and you you know across across apps or games or whatever it is you want to make sure you're consistent with the way that you present things, right? And so this is a huge leap differently, different from the original Pokemon games, but it's meant to be. Right. right? It, it, I mean, I'm it not going to it, it. Has to, it has to change with the times. And do you feel that it's... Do you feel that it's more consistent for new players and old players to come into? You know what I mean? I mean, well, no. No, because... <laughs> for both for both groups that you just mentioned, what the heck do feet mean? <laughs> I have no idea. So I have heard so many conflicting right. reports, so much so, hearsay from it. So this this feet that I'm referring to, there's a Pokemon radar in the lower right hand corner that when you click on it, it tells you what Pokemon are nearby, mm-hmm. and it tells you in little footprints. And there has been no community consensus on what the heck these things mean so far. And that's so weird, because originally when they advertised the game and when people were testing the game, they did it in a definable thing like meters. They did meters. You know, it was 50 meters, 100 meters, things like that away. But they changed that to these feet thing. So we got to just kind of hope that we go in a direction. I mean, we're finding out ways. There must be a conclusion, but it's not obvious. Right. I mean, the spatial location especially isn't really an accurate representation of where these things are. They're, they don't match the user's mental model, right? When I think three feet, I think, oh, it's literally three feet off in that direction, right? right. And if they gave me some sort of units, and I mean, this is especially um, sort of a problem in the United States because we, <laughs> st- we still use imperial units, but... The How whole... much is a stone's throw of a pound? <laughs> <laughs> what is five kilometers? I don't know. Um, no, that makes me sound like I hate Americans and that Americans are stupid, which is not the case. Uh, the Human I... Factors podcast would like to say that we love America for all its silly, silly things. No, but I mean, look, I mean, it is teaching Americans the metric system, right? Like, We, we should have made that conversion a long time ago. <laughs> we should have, but we now know what five meters is because that's how long it takes you to hatch your Pokemon egg. <laughs> I know right? ten kilometers is about six and a half miles. Yep. Because I had to look that up on Google. Thank you, Google. Right, so... So basically, what I'm saying though is that these feet that you see on this Pokey radar, mm-hmm. um, you know, it it doesn't give the user a sense of truly how far it is, right? I think each foot equates to like ten meters or something. So, or not ten meters, like ten feet or so, I don't know. It, it, see, it's all nebulous. You can't really <sighs> like we've been able to find Pokemon in the game, but it's kind of like by trial and error where we go in one direction. And hope that the feet go to two feet. And if not, then we go in a different direction. Right. And I mean, you know, you know, and then like sometimes even it even comes back to like and we're, we're still talking about consistency and standards, right? Like, right. Another thing with the game, and I understand this is a mechanic, right? So I'm not going to harp on it too much. Right. But. There's never the same Pokemon in the same place, and it's hard to establish that standard, right? Because, oh, you got a Snorlax? I want a Snorlax. I, a Snorlax is a type of Pokemon. I want to go towards... I, I'm going to go to where... I'm going to go to Balboa Park and pick me up a Snorlax. 
I go there, and it's not there. There's different things there. Right. Why? Why is that? That we I, don't... Like I said, like I said, it's a game mechanic. I understand it. Right. But... To a new user, this can be confusing, and it's even confusing to novice or to, to veteran users too, because it's like it's a completely different sort of paradigm, right? Well, yeah, I mean, there's certain consistencies, like we will find water type creatures near that's big true. bodies of water. Yeah, no, that's true. I don't know how it works in like with lakes and ponds because I live next to a beach, but I don't know how that works. But well, why then don't again, you brag. I know I live in California. It is so nice here, but I mean. I, I won't get the same type of Pokemon. I just have to kind of hope and pray. And I found weird things in... Wait, that makes a lot of sense why I was finding Goldeens in Balapoa Park. There's a Koi Pond there. There is. Oh, that's clever. All right, so what's the next one? Uh, error prevention. Right, and so this is... Uh, huh. So this is... Goes back to kind of like the... Um, oops, I made a transfer. Oh, and when you transfer in the game, you get rid of your Pokemon forever. Uh, so, so basically, you get something for it, right? Though. So, so this one is that uh, you know, even even better than a good error message of like uh, uh, system server down. <laughs> <laughs> one we're very familiar with in this app. You know, it, it, there's there's design that goes into preventing that from happening in the first place, right? So, either eliminate these conditions or check for them, um, and present users with some sort of confirmation options before they commit to them. So they, like, uh, some sort of, are you sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, a, as a user, I'm glad I didn't do that, right? Right. Uh, so, yeah, this this goes back to the are you sure, right? Um, so when you're transferring Pokemon, you know, you don't want to get rid of it. Are you sure you want to do this? Because you'll never see... Uh, <laughs> you'll never see this Pokemon again. Sorry, I just thought of... Have you seen... There's a Tumblr um, where somebody... Somebody... <laughs> Somebody goes through and renames all their Pokemon with autocorrect. I saw that! <laughs> Instead of, like, Golbat, it was Gilbert. Gilbert. Yeah, Gilbert the Golbat. No, sorry. No, I saw that. Track. No, no. Okay. Back on track. No, but yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no, but instead of transferring, you, you basically just... Uh, yeah, are you sure you want to do this? Uh, detrimental action, right? Right. Um, I mean... I'm really glad it doesn't tell you every time you throw a Pokeball. Are you sure? Because you're not gonna get, <laughs> you're not gonna get this back, right? So sometimes, you know, it's expected, right? It's a mechanic, but other times, uh, it it really does mm -hmm. make a destructive action if you don't pay attention to what you're doing. Yeah, I agree with that idea. I mean, like, you know, even if options are like, do you are you sure you want to do that? We always have the option to turn that off and not do it again. But a lot of times, it doesn't even give it that. Like, I didn't know, I assumed that when I had a Pokeball that maybe if I double-clicked on the screen, I would go and run and get the Pokeball back. But that's not the case. Once I throw it, it's gone forever. I didn't know that, and that happened through just, like, trial and error. Yeah, I don't, like I said, they're, they're not very clear on what to do. Uh, uh, what's, what's up next? Okay, recognition rather than recall. Now, this deals with brain stuff, right? Whether it's memory, like I have to pull it out of my head to remember it, or if it's just instinctual, right? Yeah. Like, like a lot of console games using a controller, I know that X is jump in a lot of games. That's recall instead of me in, a cer in certain games, I mean. In certain games, X is jump. That's not recall. That's just muscle memory, right? Is that how that works? Not quite. So, okay. so the way this works is, uh, so, right, we, we basically want to minimize the the basically cognitive load on the user, right? We want to make sure um, that sort of these actions or objects or options are visible to them instead of hidden, right? So uh, if you're talking about, like... Well, well, let's get into the Pokemon Go ex example, because this one, this one really kind of hits the nail on the head. But basically what, what, what happens is that the user's shouldn't have to remember information from one part of the system to another, right? So instructions for how to use a system uh, or, or an app or a game should be basically visible or easily retrievable whenever it's appropriate, right? So the, make the user know, I know what I need to do here. Well, I mean, like when I go in and access a Pokemon, I mean, it tells me the first time, but it's kind of instinctual, you know, ball is the trap, Ball hits Pokemon. Pokemon goes in ball. Yes, yeah, no, that's that's fine because they show you that, right? 
So I forget at what level, but you you get these things called raspberries that allow you to uh, give them to the Pokemon, and it increases your chances of catching them. Uh, and, Mm -hmm. And also, you know, later on you get different variants of Pokeballs, like the Great Ball or the Ultra Ball, that give you an even higher chance of, of getting them. So if you pair them together, uh, you know, you have a really high chance of catching this Pokemon. Right. Now, the problem with this is that, you know, you see the Pokeball on the screen. It's yeah. It's dead center at the bottom. Right. You and flick it up. Flick it and let go, and it goes and sails and hits the Pokemon in the face. Right. The system does not give you any indication that there's a raspberry to use in this situation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't give you that there's a great ball or ultra ball that you can use in this situation. It just gives you pokeballs. Right. So what what they could have done, uh, and there's plenty of room on the screen for this, but what they could have done is put like a little raspberry icon and a little great ball icon uh, on the screen itself so that way the user... Uh, recognizes that these are available mechanics to them, right? That instead of recalling, instead of remembering free, you know, basically by themselves without any reminders, oh yeah, I have this raspberry that I can use to increase my chances to catch this. I have this great ball I can use to increase my chances to catch this Pokemon. They have it on the screen saying blatantly in the face, you have these items, use us. Could you give me an example outside of Pokemon Go that does that? Just for clarification here. Like, is it kind of like the like button on Facebook? Um, or, it, it would, or is it only mostly for video games? And no, games? Well, no, no. Let's, let's take that fo- Facebook example, right? So, so let's say the like, share, and what's the third button? On comment. Facebook? Comment. Yeah, let's say the like, share, and comment buttons were hidden behind one button. So I would have to push up another button to bring up another window to do one of those things. Right. It would just be basically people saying these things on on social media, and then, you know, it it wouldn't be readily available whether or not you can like it. it it's kind of, Okay, think... This is a really good example. So think about the like button in the sense that now you have all these varying degrees of reactions. Right. Like, love... Hate, cry, right? Different emoji type. Of thing. Yeah, exactly. The average user might look at that and say, uh, "Like, read somebody's status and say, you know, my my great aunt died today, and they want to put a sad and, face and, on." And well, no. Oh. And and they want the person to recognize that they have read the status, but they are completely oblivious to the uh, the reaction. So they just hit like. <laughs> Ha <laughs> great Aunt Agnes, she was so mean. Right, I mean, <laughs> I, well, I mean, you know, they could have said something like, I'm so thankful to have spent time with my aunt, but she passed away today, right? Like, one yeah, of those, yeah, yeah, one yeah, of those yeah, ambiguous yeah. No, messages. I'm like, I like this status, it really hit me in the heartstrings. But, um, you yeah, know, so it's that kind of thing, right? Like versus hold like to get all these other available... Right you now, if you had a line of all these sort of um, reactions on that same bar where you have like, share, and comment, uh-huh. if you had them all on that bar, uh-huh. uh, that would be recall, right? Oh yeah, I remember. I can. I have more options with how I respond. Mm-hmm. Uh, but since it's hidden, you have to recall that there are options there. Okay, so like, so I get it. So you have to remember of the options at Pokemon Go. The raspberry, the different types of balls, and what the items do. You have to remember that in a time. Okay, I get it. I get it now. Yeah, All yeah, right. you got it. So, what's up next? Uh, let's see. Uh, flexibility and efficiency of use. Yeah, so we're talking accelerators. And what... So what accelerators. Are, yeah. Not like that ride at uh, Knott's Berry Farm. Is that not The Farm? accelerator. It does sound like that or like some like steampunk hip-hop band that does a lot of metal. The accelerator. Hip hop that does metal. I would, I would Wait, listen to it. That, is that a thing? Oh yeah, I'll show you later on YouTube. Okay. All right. So basically, what an accelerator is uh-huh. is a. Uh, this is some way for an expert user to skip steps. Mm-hmm. Right. This is this is uh, something that the novice user does not see, um, and and this kind of speeds up the interaction for these 
expert users, basically, so that way the system can say, yes, you can use it this, uh, this long way, but also we're giving you a shortcut if you know it, right? So these are, think about these as like the hotkeys in, uh, it, on Windows, right? Control C is copy, Control oh, V right, right, is paste. Right. Those are accelerators versus right click. Go down on Drag down copy, a menu, copy, hit the copy. Right click where you want to paste, paste, yeah. And it, it's it's that kind of deal, right? Where you're just Control C, Control V. I've never uh, used, I very rarely ever use any of those control buttons. But that goes into that memory and reaction thing. I'm used to going to the bars and everything like that. Right, exactly. Okay, so, okay. So that's what we're talking about here with accelerators. Um, and so, uh, basically, as a user, you want to allow me to do more uh, with less, right? Okay. Uh, so in Pokemon Go, all right, this is uh, something like the curveball. Right? So it, there's a mechanic in the game where if you spin the Pokeball a couple times and throw it off to the side, it's kind of like bowling, where it'll come back towards the center, right? And this, this gives you extra experience, uh, for doing it makes you look feel cool too. It does, but it <laughs> doesn't tell you that that's a mechanic. Right, it's kind of like it's, a it's secret a, tech. It's a hidden thing, but a lot of people have been using it to to increase their chances to hit the Pokemon because they they get used to the way uh, the ball curves, and it's a lot easier than just flipping up sometimes. So you know, it, it's that kind of thing, right? Um, now it's also. Uh, Maybe, like, in the sense of, like, a power user would, uh... So, in the game, you can evolve your Pokemon, right? Right. Um, and that's basically when you take them from one step of their life cycle to the next step, and they get the, more powerful. They get more powerful. Uh, and, and it takes these candies that you get from catching the same type of Pokemon. So, like, uh, there's one called a Pidgey, and, uh, you know, you, you basically catch what four pidgeys and you can evolve one yeah so you can or four or five but something on three or lines. four right if you trade them in anyway uh, <laughs> our so minds can't get too far away from here, this game here's the thing right so you you get these pidgeys and let's say you save like 20 of them right uh-huh and there's there's this thing called a lucky a in the game right that doubles the amount of experience that you get so you get more powerful, faster. Right. And so so the expert user might save all these Pidgeys and use the Lucky Egg item and then evolve all of their Pidgeys while the Lucky Egg is going. Oh my god, that's brilliant. To, you know, to boost up their level really quick. Dude, next level tech. I'm using that later tonight. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So yeah, that's that's uh, there's there's a couple accelerators in there. Um, so it kind of is like an accelerator or this whole idea of uh, flexibility and efficiency of use is kind of like the difference between someone who just picked up the game yesterday versus someone who's played the game a lot. Yeah. Some sort but, of like ability uh, or tech so that a more experienced user kind of has an edge. Not not necessarily an edge that they can just do things quicker. Right, so like, so it takes down the tedium. Right, so like, the okay, grind. so so using a curveball versus using a pokeball is not going to give you any other benefit other than feeling cool and sort of you know making sure you hit it because you're you're used to doing the angle. Right, like that's one thing. Using the lucky egg. As a novice user, you probably gain less experience than an experienced user would because they use it more efficiently. That's but that's they have more experience to get through too than the novice right. user. Right. Well, you know who who knows what level they're at. But I mean, like I like an expert user could be level one. Right. 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 Yeah. So so that's kind of what we're talking about there. What's uh, what's up next? We're on eight, right? Yeah, eight. Um, aesthetic and minimalist design. I think the game does this really well, from what I get from it. Yeah, so this is basically talking about how, like, the dialogues and sort of the screen uh, doesn't contain an overload of information. Uh-huh. Um, you know, it only contains that which is relevant and, and needed. So uh, every sort of extra unit of information or dialogue um, is, is kind of out of the way, right? Uh Basically, as a user, this looks good. It works beautifully. I'm good. Um, and with Pokemon Go, you know, I mean, what do you think? What do you 
Do you think it looks good? Do you think it... I mean, I like the design of it. I like the design. I mean, but I still think that's a very opinionated topic on it. It's it's a very minimalist type of thing. Well, yeah. So, okay. So, we're less concerned with the look of it and more concerned of, like, is there a lot of clutter on the screen that makes it unusable? No. Right. So, yeah. You know, I feel like Pokemon Go does a pretty good job of this, right? Right. I, um, there's not really much to say about the idea of it when it's minimalist, though, you know? Right. So, I mean, like, there's there's just a couple buttons that you can interact with. And then you click on those, and you can interact with more stuff. But it's very streamlined. It's very efficient. I, I would agree with that. I mean, you know, the one thing that I wouldn't sort of... I feel like it takes it too far in the capture screen where you're engaged with the Pokemon in combat or whatever it is. Right. Uh, you know, I, I feel like they take it a little bit too far. Like I said earlier, they don't show you all your options that you have available. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of trial and error still. I, well, yeah. And, and I mean, you know, especially with that menu item in that combat screen, I mean, you access the menu item and you have things like, uh, you know your incubators in there and your lucky eggs you don't need those while you're catching a pokemon why do those even show up yeah you're right why that's, that's why not... couldn't they just take those away instead of just graying them out because right. it it's... takes time and creates a little bit of frustration when you think you can use something and you can't at the moment yeah it creates more cognitive load than it needs to i mean it, it just it yeah now this one i really want to talk about help users recognize diagnose and recover from errors okay yeah um, uh, yeah, no, um... Oh, boy. I, uh, it makes me mad. I went on, like, a six-mile hike to do this, realized my game crashed, like, three miles into it, because part of the game is you have to move to hatch eggs or to find these creatures, and I realized it didn't actually update for, like, forever. Well, let's back up. So, what we're talking about here... Sorry, sorry, no, sorry, no, no. I'm getting fueled. Eat Billy is on fire. Oh, man. Rawr. No, so what we're talking about here is we're talking about error messages, uh, and basically, they you got to express these basically in plain language, right? Um, and don't don't use any codes, right? Like, so when you see an app close, app close due to error exception, S0X03, what does that mean, right? Like, I have no idea. Exactly, right? you got to explain, app closed because of uh, system um, memory dump or whatever. Like, that's that's at least kind of understandable, but something, if it said... Some problem with my memory. Right, like, uh, if it said something like, your app crashed because you're using too many other apps. That would be, like... Oh, all right, simple, yeah. Right? That would I gotcha. only close other things, right? Um, basically, as a user, you want to say, I know what went wrong, and I can fix it, right? So... Oh, okay. All right, so uh, let's talk about Pokemon Go. So, um, I mean, plain and simple, this sucks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, it's really bad, like... It doesn't tell you when it crashes half the time. It doesn't tell you why it's crashing half the time. Uh, it doesn't... It's really hard to even report a problem with the game. Because I didn't even know until we sat down and started talking about it today that there's actually a place to report bugs. Yeah, and I mean, even then, it's it's hard to do. But, I mean, okay, so... Let's talk about some of the main issues that people have been having. So, the app froze. You were on your hike, the app, the app froze. froze. You didn't know. Right. It didn't it warn me, it didn't tell me, it didn't close. Talk about plain language. It doesn't even tell you. Right. There's not even a little screen that says, oh, no. Right. And so, okay, so you figure it out, right, because nothing's popping up. You haven't seen a Pokemon in three miles. Uh, so you go, okay, let me restart the app. You close it out. You come back in. You see, please log in. Why do I have to log in again? Right. Okay. All right, so you, you log in. That's fine. And then you get this system message of, you know... <laughs> Systems are, or sy servers are down. Right. Uh, uh, okay. So you're going you're gonna to leave me at this screen. Um, what can I do? Well, you know, it, it doesn't, I don't know. Does it say, please come back later or something? Yeah, it says something like, please come check, back later. Check back later. All right. So check at back least, later. It at least gives you that sense of like, all right, come back later. But it doesn't give you any way to close the app. It doesn't give you any options to like retry. Yeah. Uh, you know, those kind of things. I mean, sometimes it's just because you had a bad connectivity at a moment. Like, I've had that problem where I've closed out the app, walked 10 feet, and it's back again. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, it's even a vague error message. 
Yeah. I, it's bad. It's just really bad. You know, um, slowly the servers have gotten a little bit better. We're a week out. Uh, and, and you know, the... Um, I mean, it's delayed in the rest of the world because of these reasons. You even said yourself, something that has this kind of server problem is usually fixed in a day or two. Yeah, so I mean, you see, like, with, with all these big games coming out, you know, if they have a server problem on day one, it's usually fixed by day two, and I think I think the creators of this game, you know, really underestimated the popularity. And, I mean, to be fair... Uh, I didn't with, think it was going to be as big as it was. Okay, well, I mean, you can kind of predict with a big IP like this that, you know, it would do pretty well. There's been pretty positive reception to the idea. Right. Uh, you know, and I can't fault them for not, you know, anticipating this, this much drain. There, yeah, there are people who are fans of not Pokemon who are fans of this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I don't blame them for that, but to not recover as quickly as they did, uh, or, or to not recover quickly, um, it, it's a little, it puts me off a little bit. Yeah, it doesn't provide a lot of help. Which is the next thing? Help and documentation. Now, what is that help and documentation? Like a user manual? Kind of. Yeah, so this is, uh, <clears throat> you know, so it's kind of like exactly like a user manual. So basically you want some sort of, uh, you want some sort of way for the user to find out what to do. Right. It's better if they don't have to, right? It's better if the app is just natively intuitive and they can figure out what they need to do right away. But if they can't, well, you know, at least there's a place they can go to check. Okay. Right? Like a fact Q. FAQ. Or FAQ, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, those... Yes, but also no. You want it kind of like like an F2 for help. Uh, sort of built into the thing. Like uh, you want it in the app. Like, if you tap on this, this is why yeah. this could be not working right You now. don't want to have to go to a Reddit to find out what's going on. Yeah, there's so uh, much misinformation out there. Yeah, so, yeah, get it directly from the developer. So, or us. I mean, <laughs> so, uh, I don't know, have you found any help in Pokemon Go? Uh, users, sorry, users and commentary in that, that's about it. Users and commentary, what do you mean? Well, like, other users have been able to oh, tell me things okay. that are wrong. And right. then I have looked at some of the user commentary, but that's about it. But so so you're saying that the help itself almost comes from externally... The, the community. The community. That's, but that's a lot of misinformation, though. Yeah, see, people... It's like going to Reddit. It's like real-life Reddit walking right, around right, right. the streets. No, there is there is a tip section in the game, right? And there it, is? It is, yeah. No, and, uh, you know, it's... It is pretty poor, though. So, like, all it says is it repeats the same thing over and over again, and it doesn't give you any way to search for content. It just says, here's a Pokestop. This is how you use it. Here's a gym. This is how you use it. This is how you fight. Uh, and right. there's there's not really any detailed explanation about the game's mechanics. Like, how do I find a Pokemon? Like, what does a foot mean? <laughs> <laughs> or... Or better yet, like, I knew a lot of people who didn't know their Pokemon had two fighting moves. Yeah. <laughs> and what that power bar means. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's there, but it, it needs to be flushed out a little bit more. I, I, I get that. I get that. But, see, the thing about it is, is even though there was a lot of problems with this game, what do you think of the overall score of it? What do you feel about this app? You know, I feel like... Wow, this is such a unique uh, sort of interesting intersection of terrible usability and wonderful experience. You typically don't find those two concepts together, right? It, right. You typically think of, wow, this thing's really easy to use. This thing's, you know, uh, a good experience. Right, right, I, right, right. I get to do what I'm doing really easily. This it comes tremendously difficult to do anything. Like we put in but, work. Yeah, but it's an amazing experience not because of the app, but because of the community it creates, right? Like you go out and you find these people on the street that are playing the same you walk around and anyone who's staring at their phone flicking upwards, you know they're playing Pokemon Go. And right. there's this weird camaraderie among all of us, and we just go, hey, what team are you? By the way, Billy, what team are you? I am Team Mystic. Team Mystic, all the way. We are Team Blue at the HF Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
I mean, that's the thing. It creates a lot of great co- thing, but uh, community. But it's also about the subject material. The subject material is so strong. Right. Well, I mean, it's a very strong IP, intellectual yeah. property. You know, I mean, you know, I've, again, like we can't attribute it to the usability of the app, but. I'm I mean, not going to uninstall it anytime soon, even if they have server errors for another, like, two months. You know what, though? Here is here is one thing that I can give credit to the app for. You know, it does have mechanics that encourage this community, right? Like, uh, you do have people going out and converging on these spots where these Pokemon are going to be. Right. Uh, and, you, you know, you have these community-driven events, like these lures that you use at Pokestops that draw humans in. And right. And... You know, there have been some pretty bad things that have happened, like armed robberies or, you know, but there there are so many positives for such little negatives. It seems really interesting, the fact that it's not so much people talking about the game and what they catch. People talk about that, sure, but not as much as the people they've met and the moments and the stories they've had. Right, I was walking around the Irvine Spectrum and I saw, like... 20 people just gathered in one spot. Yeah, it's those kind of stories. Yeah, so. or, or when I was in the middle of Balboa Park and 30 people came running in a direction. I mean, everybody's complaining about how often the app crashes or how in, unintuitive it is. People right. see this even though they don't listen to our podcast, which you should always listen to our podcast. Yeah, but, but, but the, <laughs> the point is that they're talking about it and they're communicating with each other, other parts of uh, the community. Yeah, and I think that's really cool. Even though there are different teams... I don't feel like an opposition against right. the other two I mean, teams. I mean, I was driving around the other day, and I looked out my window, and I see people flicking up on their phones, and I'm like, good luck, trainers. You know, And I'm just like, I, it makes me want to be a good person to other people who are out there and like be safe. I'm kind of in this whole like idea of internet toxicity that we have in this world where people get angry and throw death threats over Twitter and stuff like that, it's kind of nice to see a game that brings people together. It's amazing, isn't it? It's like... That's awesome. It's like when Minecraft made Game of the Year and was, like, the top-selling game for as long as it was. It's just, wow, instead of shooting and killing things, it's just hanging out and catching fictional monsters. Yeah, exactly. You know? So, but, yeah, the the the, the usability is terrible. not great. It's <laughs> it's a terrible idea. and No, it's not a terrible idea. I mean, no, I'm not terrible a terrible idea. execution. Execution. See... The other thing about it is, is we want you to also note about this podcast is that we may think that usability is terrible in certain games, and we might be hard on certain aspects of games that we love, but it's not about us loving the game, it's about the usability of the game in this podcast. Am I right? It's, well, it's about how the human factors in, right? Right. It's a human how, factors podcast. Right, exactly. So the idea of it is, is that don't think that we are hating on a game for the future, don't think that we're hating on a game just because we're like, eh, it wasn't that great, did these things, when we're talking about usability. We're, yeah, we're dissecting it to see what kind of psychological components come out of these things. And sometimes it's like that, but it's still a great game. And, so, and you know, that's the problem. We could never give it a score of, like, a 100 or a 1 because... Yeah, it, it's it's so subjective. Scores yeah, exactly. are all subjective. Exactly. So, anyway, here's the last part of the show. This is where we would normally uh, take questions from you guys, our listeners. But since this is the first episode, uh, you know, we need you guys. You guys, our listeners, we need you. We need you. We need you to send in your questions first. So, send us your questions on all the social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. That's it for today. Uh, I've been your host, Nick Rome, and you can find me on LinkedIn.com slash Nick Rome. And you can also find me on Twitter at Comstar Cleric. Until next time, it, it depends! depends.